Good morning. Your Eminence, Cardinal Marx, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear professors, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me as the rector of the Pontifical Gregorian University to welcome you all to the inauguration of the Licentiate Program in Safeguarding and an interdisciplinary program promoted and run by the Center for Child Protection in the name of the whole university. I welcome the authorities here present, our benefactors, our guests, the students of the diploma program that goes into its fourth year of existence, and of course, the students of the new licentiate program who have been admitted according to criteria that include their level of motivation and the perspective of having in the future a responsible position in the field of safeguarding. As you may already know, the vision of the Center for Child Protection is a world where children, adolescents, and other vulnerable persons are safe, be it within the Catholic Church or in society at large. In this very special occasion, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Father Hans Zoner, the president of the CCP, and to his team for their commitment in the implementation of this vision. The university and the CCP have received renewed encouragement and strength in this challenging task from the letter of Pope Francis to the people of God of the 20th August 2018. Acknowledging once again the suffering endured by, by many minors to the sexual abuse, the abuse of power, and the abuse of conscience perpetrated by a significant number of clerics and consecrated persons, Pope Francis states clearly Looking back to the past, no effort to beg pardon and to seek to repair the harm done will ever be sufficient. Looking ahead to the future, no effort must be spared to create a culture able to prevent such situations from happening, but also to prevent the possibility of their being covered up and perpetuated. In a similar way, the university and the CCP have received encouragement from the letter of Father Arturo Souza, Superior General of the Society of Jesus of the 24th August 2018. The title of this letter addressed to the whole Society of Jesus and companions in mission sounds quite clear to share the suffering of victims of abuse and foster a culture of protection. This is indeed our vision and our mission and the purpose of the new licentiate program in safeguarding. Father Arturo Souza stresses that the Holy Father invites us to personal, communal and institutional conversion to attend to the coherence and integrity of our lives and to orient our apostolic action toward bringing about a culture within and outside the church capable of ensuring that situations of abuse are not repeated. Finally, Father Sozo asks all the Jesuit institutions to do everything possible to collaborate in healing this situation in the church and to act in creative ways to promote in all of its complex dimensions a culture of protection of minors and vulnerable persons. This is, this is indeed our task and the task of all involved in the new licentiate program in safeguarding. We are well aware 
that no single person or institution can take this responsibility alone. We must be allied in this effort to protect child dignity, as you must understand that we are all responsible for each other in our world. It is a world of great complexity in which problems need to be faced from many perspectives. This is the role of the university as well as its academic and research centers. Let's face this, challenging, this challenge with courage and humility. Thank you very much for your presence and your commitment. Thank you very much for the lecture and uh, thank you again for being present here, especially our honored guests, uh, our friends and donors, all the ambassadors who are here and our distinguished speakers. Many of you have accompanied our journey uh, for the last almost seven years now and uh, we are really glad that so many of you are here, that so many of you support us in different ways. We couldn't do, the team of the CCP couldn't do uh, what we do, what we try to do without you, your support in terms of prayer, in terms of teaching, in terms of uh, in-kind help and in terms of economic support. The CCP continues to offer a program of blended learning with at the moment 56 partner institutions in about 30 countries with 1,500 students around the world who have finished the blended learning course and more than 700 who are enrolled at this very moment. When we transferred from Munich to Rome to this university nearly four years ago, we realized that across the globe there is a great and growing need for specialized training for personnel in the area of safeguarding. After three successful sessions of the diploma course, it has become clear that the preparation of child protection officers who implement guidelines and safeguarding measures in their institutions is an important contribution to dioceses, religious congregations and numerous other realities and needs to grow. However, we saw the need for a licentiate or a master's course to teach and a further preparation to create and implement guidelines to engage in a dialogue with the scientific, academic and political world. We are here today to inaugurate the two-year master's degree in ecclesiastical terms a licentiate, a full second cycle academic degree which has been approved by the Congregation for Catholic Education, our Church Ministry for Education. And it will be awarded by the university that is new, not by a single faculty, but by the university itself. This means that this degree is multidisciplinary from the outset. It will allow for students with degrees in different disciplines to receive foundational knowledge across different fields and different disciplines and at the same time to deepen their formation with regard to their personal field of expertise. The curriculum is a program of the best scientific input available and at the same time will aim at praxis. As we want to serve the Universal Church, this program is culturally sensitive and applicable in a variety of settings. We believe that this is attained when education and formation endeavor to engage the person at their deepest level, impacting and expanding a person's resilience, adaptability, capacity for self-reflection, ability to trust, spirituality, and trustworthiness. A formation which brings about attitudinal change and concrete action. That is our aim. 
At this time, we are offering areas of specialization in the fields of theology, canon law, education and pedagogy, and psychology. The master's course takes what we've learned to a new level, to not only train the experts for institutions, but also to create a network of skilled and committed persons, safeguarders for the church. The network is growing, and it is a direct result of the resources we have received, the gifts of time, treasure, talent, and prayer. We discover every day people who want to work with us for a safer world for children and adolescents. We experienced this exactly a year ago when we co-hosted here at the Gregorian the Congress Child Dignity in the Digital World. And we are very happy that delegates from China from the Emirates, uh, from North America, have traveled for this occasion to join us again. We are grateful for all support and prayers of all, especially of survivors of abuse and of very special people. And if at the end of my um, presentation I can show you the, uh, the letter that has been, this is an image from uh, um, last year's Congress when we were received by Pope Francis. <clears throat> uh, at the end of the Congress, when the participants of the Congress handed over to him the Declaration of Rome, which has brought about numerous activities, which I cannot list now. One is uh, the one that Major Dana Humaid will speak about, but um, we are also very glad that the Holy Father Emeritus, Papa Emeritus Benedict, sends his greetings. As we have heard, um, uh, Pope Francis has given his blessings through Cardinal Marx to us this morning. We are also glad that uh, Pope Benedict uh, uh, is with us in this very moment in prayer. There are many people who have accompanied us on our journey and who their financial support have allowed us to develop what we offer. Cardinal Marx, the Archbishop of Munich and Freising, the President of the Bishops' Conference in Germany, and a member of the Holy Father's Council of Cardinal Advisors, is uh, one who has personally uh, been interested in our journey from the beginning, from the late 2011 uh, to this date. And we are grateful for the different kinds of support the Archdiocese of Munich has given us and uh, to the Cardinal for accepting the invitation to speak. Our topic is at the forefront of the pu public discourse in the church and in society, as all of us know who follow news. And we thank you, Cardinal, uh, for your being with us and for your willingness to address now this topic. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear brothers and sisters, I was here, Father Solner said this, six years ago when we made the first symposium and when I compare the text of uh, my conference in 2012 and now I will present another text but not another idea, that's clear. But I see in my text and in my reflections, also with my collaborators, uh, the subject, the issue, uh, is much more urgent. We had a great discussion in 2010, but, but now we see we have to go forward. We have to see uh, clearer, deeper. Uh, and the research is all over the world, and also this uh, German research in the last week uh, is a point to, to, to show that we uh, that it's a, it is an urgent situation also in the in the universal church because some regions some continents are becoming aware uh, we we are going uh, away since 2002 when I was first confronted with these questions as a bishop of Trier and then we learned we learned we learned but the learning way is not at the end. What's more urgent, I see this. And you will f feel it, I think, in the text I present to you. Uh, I begin with uh, 
The first point, excuses. Abuse is a crime and in any civilized society it is normally obvious how to handle crimes. They must be investigated and dealt with. No one will see this general observation as a stumbling block and no one will have serious objections to it. It is therefore all the more surprising, also after years, in fact all the more shocking and incomprehensible to realize that with respect to sexual abuse within the area of responsibility of the Catholic Church, there were apparently other standards. Not investigating and dealing with, but rather suppressing, covering up, avoiding, dodging and denying the issue very apparently were apparently the key guidelines when handling the issue of sexual abuse in the past and perhaps also in the present. I don't see all the situations in the world. Although the church should clearly have known that to do in, uh, in the event of such crimes being committed based on its ethical and moral principles, church leaders were clearly ambiguous regarding the crimes which were primarily committed by ordained persons employed by the church. Instead of fulfilling their responsibility to adequately combat abuse and its consequences, they have clearly not done so and essentially avoided the issue or even worse, deliberately ignored it. The excuses that made this possible and which served as self-justification for this behavior were many and were varied, varied. For some, the topic of abuse was only an evil conspiracy, conspiracy concocted by a press hostile to the church. I, I, I have this in my memory. In 2010, it was very strong. This is the, the media against us. And for others, this was a sufficient excuse to point out that most abuses don't happen in the church, but in the family environment. Still, I hear these voices. Still, others contented themselves with the comparative statement that it was no better elsewhere. And therefore, why apply such pressure, such pressure within and directed towards the church regarding abuse? Sometimes it was sufficient to soothe complaints and justify their own inaction by making such scandalous statements as the abuse was more, uh, less, more or less just a one-off mistake made by the offender who one has known as a brother for a long time since the seminary. The epitome of self-deception by those responsible was using theological argumentation as an excuse for doing nothing about abuse. You know the terms, the terms as reconciliation, mercy, benevolence and clemency were hastily introduced to override considerations such as repentance, atonement and legal consequences and negate any such actions. Those responsible in the church who always immediately forgave the perpetrators without facing up to the difficult process of repentance and penance by the offender, as well as reparation and reconciliation for the victim, in whichever form is appropriate, ob obviously saw a little need for further action. It was and is sometimes a danger, and I am part of it. I'm 22 years bishop, 40 years priest. I cannot say I am outside, but this close shop mentality to be together, to help each other, to protect each other. This is a mentality uh, also and, 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 uh, and uh, also very strong in the, in the church, in the clergy. That's, that's like this. We are part of it, we have to see it. Let us not fool ourselves. These excuses which serve to explain the own inaction or put more bluntly the own failure to act no longer work, that is clear. Not now, since years it's clear, but you must repeat it, that is over. It is not only that these excuses are very weak and no longer tolerated by the public, but it is also worth noting 
those who use these or similar excuses are equally guilty of causing the suffering of the victims and become complicit in some way with the perpetrators. I look on also always on my way or on our way since 2010. But we cannot go, cannot stay in, 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 in these convictions. We have to go forward. And we, we made it, I think, also with the help of the center here and with our reflections. But we were not in the, in the, in the reality 2000 or 2002 like today. But it's not the end, I repeat it. We must go forward. And so uh, we have to underline uh, the future. How weak these excuses are is obvious upon simple, upon simple reflection. Firstly, the proven number of abuse cases, and that was not clear in 2002, perhaps. Uh, we, had, we had the idea, yes, we will be clear and open, but there are s some cases. That was the idea. The proven number of abuse cases, such as reflected in the recently published study on abuse in the German Diocese on its own forbids any talk of a co conspiracy by the press against the church. It's a great number, much more than I ever imagined in 2002 or 2010. We see it now clearer. The damage is not caused by the press doing their job properly, but rather by the church itself. It is caused by the church leadership not fulfilling their obligations, also by us. Secondly the, secular, secondly, the sexual abuse outside of the church does not make abuse within the church any better. In all other matters, the church always sets very high moral standards and is sometimes very quick to condemn abuses outside of the church. It cannot and may not be that one sets external standards, yet essentially ignores them internally. That one points a finger at others on moral grounds and feels qualified and morally justified to do so, and yet fails miserably oneself. Yesterday we heard a, a very good intervention. I don't uh, say the, the name, we will see it perhaps later when the, uh, the publication will be made from the Synod. Very clear, the voice of the bishop, I apologize, I apologize for, for what happened. Uh, thirdly, talk of a one-off mistake goes against scientific evidence, which shows a, a high relapse rate for child abuse and which is certainly not reduced by pointing out that one has known the preparator, pre perpetrator, perpetrator for a long time. In addition, the reference is also very open and known in the church, uh, the reference to knowing the offender on a personal basis goes against the principles of good management, which is not unilaterally and improperly influenced by personal acquaintance. And fourthly, a theology which is oversimplified and used directly as an instrument to hinder law enforcement loses its own character and can therefore not be effective. Ultimately, it should be clear what such weak excuses, and excuses in general, can cause in cases of abuse and the church responsibility in this regard. They represent a tri tri trivialization of the suffering of the victims, and this is not recognized. As a result, the church fails in its duty towards the victims and survivors and their dignity as children of God. In this way, exactly, the opposite happens of what the church should do, of who we should do, namely not pushing the small and weak aside, but putting them at the center, which in cases of abuse means not surreptitiously trying to avoid responsibility, but instead accepting, but instead accepting full responsibility, listening to the survivors and giving them a voice. If the church fails to do so, if we fail to do so, then we lose credibility as a moral authority and proclaimer of God's kingdom. And that is all in the disc public discussions, you can read it. The church has lost credibility 
and we don't want to hear the voice of the church in other moral uh, points. That is in the discussion in Germany and I think in other countries the same. It loses its missionary strength in carrying out evangelization, the building up of God's kingdom, which is also a kingdom of justice. Second point, public pressure. In recent years we have experienced this with increasing intensity. It's also my experience. The public is less and less accepting if the church is silent on abuse in its own ranks or tries to avoid responsibility by making excuses. In this regard, one cannot entirely dispute the fact that this non-acceptance and the related growing public pressure on the church has helped considerably to initiate a new way of thinking within the church. Clearly, the church is only able to change itself to a limited extent. That was also in our lectures in former times. Some people said only from outside, when the danger is there, when, when there is pressure, there is a reform, a real reform in the church. From inside, it's very, it's possible, but very, very, uh, not so easy. So the pressure from outside is a help, perhaps. The reasons for this many for, for, for the reasons that the church cannot or is not able or is sometimes, when you look in history, not always able to reform uh, itself, uh, these reasons are varied. There's a fundamental fear of change, loss of power, stigmatization of the internal problems, destabilization and much more. The center is the fear of loss of power. All this may be understandable, but this does not make it acceptable. How should the church, how should be, we be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, reacting instead of being proactive and to have a prophetic effect on the world? It is sad but true that such a, a, a church is good for nothing. It's a self narcissistic church, like the Pope underlined, the, uh, is uh, interested in, in, uh, in itself, in surviving, but not seeing the mission. It is therefore, therefore dependent on the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. Through him, renewal is possible. I believe it, and perhaps he is manifesting, manifesting himself also, and in particular, in particular through the above mentioned public pressure. Maybe we can feel the breath of the Spirit in this way, encouraging us to do what we could hardly accomplish alone. I think, without these voices, there would not be a, a change. Let us therefore be grateful for this pressure, grateful for the public criticism, grateful for the voices of the survivors who become uh, and became louder, which help us to change ourselves, to develop further, to become better. We should not see the critics as opponents, but rather in a good sense as cooperators with the Holy Spirit. When I look on the last 16 years, I would say for me it was a help. All these reactions are in me. It's clear, as a normal person. But at the end, in the reflection in my prayer, I saw this is necessary. This is necessary. Third point, all or nothing. For some time now, with external help and critically constructive support, the Church has increasingly faced up to the challenge of dealing appropriately with abuse allegations and cases of abuse. This is evidenced by the numerous, numerous prevention and intervention measures also this, uh, this uh, center founded seven years ago. Man measures aimed at protecting victims and prosecuting perpetrators. Amongst other things, 
These measures, measures should enable detection of abuse, identification of inappropriate behavior at an early stage, elimination of risk factors, and increased awareness of help available. In order for this to happen successfully, it requires the involvement of independent experts from different areas of specialization, such as psychology, criminology, pedagogy, sociology, sociology etc., who can contribute their expertise, their expertise without any restrictions. It's important that the human science, uh, the knowledge of the world, of the human science, is also uh, can enter in our also re theological reflections. Specialists from within the church alone are insufficient, often not only because of their capacities, but also due to the danger of not having a clear perspective. Some call it organi organizational blindness. If this is so, if this is so, must be determined individually in each case. The critical theory spoke in Germany in the 60s about Verblendungszusammenhang. For the, I cannot translate this. Verblend, there is a, there is a blindness uh, in looking on a special situation. Uh, special, uh, the the sociology of a closed shop is like this. No? Blindness. They cannot see the realities. It's also important to check whether the necessary changes regarding the church's handling of the entire complex issue, uh, complex, complex issue of abuse, become stuck halfway. The new research shows us a little bit this. This would certainly be the case if the rather individual and case-oriented, as well as abuse-centered prevention and intervention measures are not supported by a more systemic-oriented approach. And the, the new research is underlining this in the, in the proposals. Now look on these system, systemic points also, not only the individual cases, prevention of the persons, but also changing structures. And that's a new step, I think. Such a systemic-oriented approach focuses attention on the church as a whole system, going far beyond the issue of abuse. This involves fundamental structures, patterns, processes, and roles within the church. These must be taken into account to ensure lasting, sustainable changes, because, after all, they facilitate the durab durability, durability and strength of a system, and without them, almost every change only has slim chances of survival. To, to make a sermon is good, but to change a system is to make both, to make a moral, moral uh, challenge, but then help with institutions, with control, with mechanisms to stabilize these intentions. Otherwise, you will speak, but no results. The system itself is to, to some extent a problem with regard to, to, to uh, abuse. And I think also in the, in the Synod we will have this new discussion. That this must be the case has been shown by the various investigations in different countries on different continents, which always ultimately encounter more or less the same problem situations, whether it is in the United States, Australia, or more recently in Europe and Germany. Against this background, it must be allowed to not only ask questions, but also to investigate in detail whether or not the decisive elements of the church system, which are the same worldwide, based on the itself perception as a global church, have something to do with this finding. Two major points requiring attention appear to be inadequate dealing with, dealing with power as well as immature sexuality. In this context, problems just as, such as inadequate record-keeping and administration, insufficient training for priests, a more than lax personal management, and unjustifiable co cover-up mechanisms to protect the organization are essentially subtopics, perhaps, uh, and we see it now, 
of the two main problem areas, power and sexu sexuality. Taking into account this systemic, systemic aspect when dealing with the complex subject of abuse is also a matter of survival for the church, at least in its current form, especially concerning its rights to freedom. A socio-political socio argument alone makes this clear. No constitutional state with a liberal demo democratic order can effort to tolerate a system equipped with certain freedoms within its borders, which for inherent systemic reasons does not live up to the basic values of the state, such as the right to integrity of, of the persons, e.g. with regard to protection against risk of abuse. If no corrective action is taken by the church, and we are working on it, and we must work on it, the state has no other choice to, but to intervene simply based on its self-perception. Under such circumstances, this could hardly be judged as an attack on the church. This applies all the more of one, if one also considers that in an increasingly plural society, very different social groups to the church could also become involved, attempting to exploit such freedoms to establish subsystems contrary to the constitutional state. In this case, church representatives would certainly have nothing against state intervention. On the contrary, they would probably even support it. But here too, one, one cannot demand from others something that one would reject for oneself under the same circumstances. All in all, the church is called upon to systematically investigate the systemic aspects of abuse in addition to implementing the prevention and intervention measures all over the world. This may cause deep insecurity because the fundamental patterns of church life are being called into question and it's not immediately foreseeable where this way this may lead. But it is preferable to live with such uncertainty rather than the certainty that we are contributing to the destruction of individuals and the church itself. If there is no systemic, system, systemic effort towards systemic change. For, fourth, a fresh start. In my conference six years ago, I made a th at this point a theological point. You can read it, but I want to say only one word about it because this is sounding, perhaps for some years, a little bit technical. Is it possible to speak about the church in this, in this way? Uh, and uh, six years ago, I made a look on my doctorate, very, very long away. But there was the, the central, the central uh, argument, the central point was the church is in analogy to the, uh, to the incarnation like Lumen Gentium 8, a very important article of Lumen Gentium, is showing the Chalcedonian structure of the church. The church is society, like Jesus was a human being. And this integral human being is used by the Logos, by the Holy Spirit, to be the Son of God. And also in this analogy, the Holy Spirit uses the absolutely human society, which is called church, as an instrument. And so the laws, the, 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 the knowledge about good societies, about uh, good living together, we cannot say as church, that is not, uh, we are in a special, we are an own, an own we are a rea reality directly come, coming from heaven. No, it's a human society. And so all laws of human society, all knowledge about a good society is also applied to the church to look how the church can live together. It's clear that is not a democracy and so on. You have to show this in, a, in the theological reception. But to say we are special, 
that is not the way, theological. So th this must be in our heads. So I will not, it's not otherwise too long, but remember Lumen Gentium 8 and Chalcedonian structure of the church. So we can also use technical words. We can uh, use sociological patterns to, to make a better church, to make a better living together in the church. Subsidiarity, solidarity, all these words are not strange for us. Uh, the, the church is also, not only, also a uh, sociological uh, 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 entity. And uh, that is very, and that has consequences. So a fresh start, the debate regarding the need for, for system, systemic, systematic, systematic, systemic change in the church could start with the clarification of three points. Good governance, which does not take place automatically. Good governance is also, you can say, that's a management world. But it's also a spiritual world, good governance. Look on the tradition of the Jesuits. Simply by the, as a good governance, which does not take place automatically, simply by the sacramental consecration of leadership personnel. I said it six years ago in the same way. Leadership must be learned and practiced. You cannot say you are ordained so you can be a leader. That's, that's absolutely unacceptable. Leadership must be learned and practiced. This includes, for example, uh, conflict management skills just as much as knowledge of personal management dealing with ones. I said it also to the young bishops in their, in their weeks, in the baby course of bishops, let's say. And they're some, sometimes surprised, but it's normal. Weak, thoughtless people will, with no leadership training who assume leadership roles such as that of bishop are not in a position to deal with difficulties within the institution they lead. This raises the question of what positive steps can be made to appropriately select people for leadership positions, empower them and support them. We discussed it also, we, I said it in the Congregation of Bishops. Yes, uh, something is made, but you have to look closer to this. Secondly, compliance, also a word of the management. I was, before I became bishop, I made also courses for managers. So I'm not, it's 30 years ago, okay, but I was in this scene, in, the, in this uh, milieu, so I, it's not strange for me to speak about these things, and I learned a lot about this, uh, uh, about this uh, uh, way to bring people together, to motivate people, uh, leadership, responsibility, compliance, which especially in the church system has almost no separation. That is our problem of executive, legislative and judicial, judicial power for theological reasons, making it difficult to implement, particularly regarding the role of bishops. But also in the church, it must be clear, it's no absolute power. No absolute power. Also, the, although the Pope, no absolute power. We cannot every, every day think, oh, what can I do today? I am free, I have the absolute power. Incredible. The question is, how can it be ensured that all leaders within the church, including the bishops, must adhere to generally binding rules which limit capriciousness, arbitrariness, and lack of transparency as much as possible? And also here, yeah, we have to underline, uh, and, and I, I remember these courses of managers, and uh, you have to look on the person to make self-restrictions, to have an own idea, personality, to develop this person, but you need also institutions, control of power, uh, formation, and, and uh, uh, not only looking on the, on the person and of the goodwill of the person. That is not enough, that is very important, otherwise you don't come forward, but you need also this uh, uh, framework, this uh, framework uh, to, to support this. Self-restrictions and institutions. And this also in the church. And we have this, but we have to develop it. And it's possible, I think, all, also in the theological and uh, 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 in the theological framework. Thirdly, accountability, responsibility, 
which precisely because of the hierarchical structure of the church is only rudimentary, particularly at the upper level. This raises the question of how a higher degree of accountability on the part of leaders can be achieved, for example, by changing the decision-making powers delegated to church bodies and individual leaders. I think we have also to develop the canon law. Uh, this is also uh, uh, the time to look on the canon law to make, uh, to make a, a progress, to make a learning from the, from the world, not only being only together with our experts, but to look what is going on in the uh, development of the canon law. If the principles of good governance, compliance, and accountability had been fundamentally anchored within our church, then probably much could have been prevented, which is currently identified as scandalous misconduct in dealing with abuse cases. Uh, abuses of power, failures of leadership, and to a certain extent a systemic induced silence should all be combated as far as possible to avoid the abuse scandal being followed by more scandals in other areas. Only briefly, I, I will not go further, but briefly mention here the abuse, ab abusive behavior by priests towards female members of religious orders, or the notorious misuse of financial resources. Systemic change don't just happen by themselves. The corresponding agents of change, it's also a word of the sociological theory, but I think in the church we sometimes call them saints, agents of change, are required actors and initiators who in the worst case are also willing to provoke controversy and tackle conflicts within the affected system without losing their positive vision. This, in turn, requires a mature personality who faces up the challenge with an appropriate at attitude and inner strength. Developing such personalities and providing related educational opportunities are in their own best interests of a system, in our case the Church, for the reasons set out earlier above. In the pre-conclave, I remember, I, I, I said in the pre-conclave five years ago, uh, we need uh, 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 in the Curia and in the church uh, op an open discussion and not looking on my superior and I say what he wants to hear. That is not the way to bring things forward. And this is also here the case. The study program beginning now for the protection of children should also be seen in this light as an as agent, you are angels, agents of change then, offering significant opportunities for both the individual participants, participants as well as the church as a whole. I hope that this contribution, contribution will be made from this program. Certainly it's clear not everybody can, uh, can follow this program, not every bishop, not, uh, but perhaps we have to, 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 to look what are the connected uh, institutions, also the diplomatic service of the Holy See to help them in their formation, and so on. They're, they're the courier, uh, to look what can we do to, to, to offer our, our contribution to changements. Nevertheless, it remains the task of, of, of all of us to work on our own mentalities and attitudes. How this can happen, among many other possibilities, is demonstrated by an anniversary several years ago and some people wrote uh, about this to me, this uh, so-called Pact of the Catacombs after the, after the Second, uh, uh, Second Vatican Council, with which several hundred bishops committed themselves to a different kind of church. In short, for them it was about, about a church with people at the center of its ministry or what I said in the sermon, going beside him, and so going beside with the people, who do not act aloof or power-hungry. Specifically, if one looks closely, it was, about, uh, it was about asceticism in the sense of appropriate self-restraint and self-discipline. 
which are the essential keys to successful systemic changes regarding accountability, compliance, and good governance. And uh, this is one point, but you have to look also on the systemic changements. At this point, there is impetus so perhaps re to revisit this historical pact of the catacombs and to, to look in a new way what, what this hour now is saying to the church. Not only for, well, I, I think about this also personally, but uh, uh, also not only the goodwill of some bishops, but also in the structural changement which is necessary. And um, no fundamental systemic change can occur without changing attitudes and mindsets. And uh, there can be no restoration of the church credibility without fundamental systemic, systemic change. This is perhaps the most concise, concise way to summarize everything said previously. Particularly against the backdrop of the Synod on Youth currently taking place, it is to be hoped that this causes constructive, a constructive unrest, this uh, thinking and, and changing, which gives the whole church positive impetus towards further development. At the end, finally, looking forward, the abuse scandals that have rocked the church throughout the world and plunged it into one of the most difficult crises give rise to many questions and tasks for the future. That's not the end. We, we hear it from the continents. This is challenging and strenuous, but at the same time, there are no alternatives. We must work together to help promote a wide range of constructive, constructive initiatives and to create synergies. In this regard, I can already say for myself personally, but also for the Archdiocese of Munich and Freising, that we will continue to support the Center of Child Protection and provide funding. All the same time, I would also like to invite other supporters to do the same. The CCP, which is not only closely connected with the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, but also with the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors, offers both opportunities for appropriate training measures in the wider context of abuse prevention, as well as effective impulses for systemic changes, which ultimately only the Holy See can implement, and has, therefore, I underline it, a, a theological challenge. It's not only a practical way, but it's also a theological, systematic uh, reflection, uh, which is necessary. Let us tackle the changes ahead with faith in the power of the Holy, Sp with faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, and hope for the assistance for our Lord Jesus Christ, who stands with the weak and the small. And we want to stay with Him. It is a serious but challenging hour for the Church. Please don't have fear. Thank you. Geltzgott, Kardinal. In uh, Bavarian we say, may God reward you. Um, all of us, I think, can feel how much you personally have reflected, prayed, and thought about this, and how much you are committed yourself to safeguarding. You said it in your homily, and you said it now. When you talk about sexual abuse committed within the church, we don't talk about only sexual misbehavior. We talk about many other things which you have laid out also from your sociological um, uh, um, training. It uh, was a, a, a very dense input that we have received now and, and I think it's timely that we'll have a piece from the choir uh, which first of all will give us an, <coughs> an opportunity to thank them also for their performance during Mass. Thank you very much. And secondly, <coughs> and secondly, it gives an opportunity to invite all of you 
for tomorrow's artistic performance, which will take place at 8 p.m. in St. Ignatius Church, a piece that is composed uh, specifically for the occasion. Uh, it uh, is um, then performed by the State Opera uh, of Bavaria artists, and it is um, a way to give voice to victims within the church, the church building, St. Ignatius Church, and the church as a reality uh, of a faith community that have forgotten to listen and have denied victims to be uh, really listened to. So all of you are invited for tomorrow evening, Saturday, tomorrow at 8 p.m. in St. Ignatius Church. We'll listen to the choir now.
Thank you very much, the Gregorian University Choir. Thank you. We proceed now with the two uh, further addresses. Um, exactly a year ago, from 3rd to 6th October 2017, the CCP co-hosted, together with Telefono Azzurro and the PROTECT, the Congress on Child Dignity in the Digital World, that concluded with the Declaration of Rome that I've mentioned earlier, in which the participants called on, among others, governments and social media providers to take responsibility for the safety of youth in the online world. One of the keynote speakers at the Congress was Prof Professor Elizabeth Letourneau, director of the Moore Center at the Bloomberg School of Health at Johns Hopkins University. We are privileged to have her here again as she will provide us with an overview of the worldwide state of research and safeguarding and future prospects in the field. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Excellent. I want to thank Father Zollner for inviting me to join you in celebrating the launch of the two new educational programs on safeguarding of minors. For the past year, Father Zollner and I have collaborated to develop a program of research that aims to prevent child sexual abuse on a global scale. This is no easy task, and it absolutely demands training the next generation of leaders on the importance of child safety. The programs offered by the Center for Child Protection are necessary if we are to achieve a world free from child sexual abuse. I have no idea where I'm supposed to point this thing to get the slides to advance. Is there someone here smarter than I am who can? <laughs> Great. Wait, not that person. Somebody else smarter than I am. Oh, ah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, as a researcher, I have worked on the prevention of child sexual abuse for more than 30 years. I know this topic very well. However, when I talk about child sexual abuse prevention, People often tell me they have a difficult time envisioning what I mean. So I'd like to take a step back and look at prevention in other areas, well-known areas. At Johns Hopkins University, where I work, public health researchers pioneered the use of latex gloves by surgeons, the child safety car seat, and optimized the polio vaccine. Each of these prevention tools the gloves, the car seats, the vaccines, seems easy and obvious today. But each of them had to be invented, which took resources, and each was met with some resistance. Many surgeons and nurses initially balked at wearing gloves. Many parents initially balked at using car seats. Um, this actually happened in my own family. I am one of five children, I'm the oldest, and my sister Jenny is 23 years younger than I am. Car seats were not around when I was growing up, but by the time she was born, they were the law of the land. You can't leave a hospital without a car seat. And my mom hated those things. She was convinced that Jenny would cry less, fuss less, if she could just roam around in the car like me and my brothers had all been allowed to do. No one feels that way anymore. None of us would let a surgeon operate on us without gloves. Most of us trust the promise of vaccine over the threat of disease, and everybody uses car seats with their babies. I believe the prevention of child sexual abuse could look like this in five or 10 years, that with the right resources, we can develop interventions that one day also seem easy and obvious.
When we think about preventing public health problems like child sexual abuse, it can be helpful to think of this pyramid. At the broadest level, efforts reach everyone, prevention efforts reach everyone by targeting socioeconomic factors and the context in which people live to help them make healthy decisions and to make healthy decision making possible. More targeted efforts address the needs of people at specific risk. In this case, the needs of people at risk of engaging in harmful sexual behavior with children. And the most limited and costly programs address the needs of people who have already offended or the needs of people who have been victimized. For the remainder of this presentation, I'm gonna describe some of the prevention efforts underway at the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse and how these efforts fit within this pyramid. And I will also describe the prevention efforts that Father Zollner and I hope to lead. One of our studies involves an evaluation of national policy. In the US, low-income children are eligible for health insurance called Medicaid. States have the option to expand Medicaid to low-income adults. Many positive impacts have been attributed by expanding Medicaid health insurance to low-income adults, including positive impacts on risk factors that directly contribute to child and family violence, risk factors such as parent and child mental health issues, parent and child substance misuse, and family financial instability. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is funding my team to evaluate whether expansion of Medicaid health insurance is associated with reductions in violence, including reductions in child sexual abuse and child physical abuse, youth on youth violence, and violence between intimate partners. We have just launched this study and we do not yet have results to report. However, if Medicaid expansion is shown to reduce violence, this would be an example of prevention policy at the broadest socioeconomic levels. Results will be of particular interest in the United States for the 18 states that have not yet expanded Medicaid to low-income adults, and they will be of interest to countries where universal health care has not yet been implemented. Another of our studies at the Moore Center seeks to alter the context in which adolescents engage in sexual behavior. Many efforts to prevent public health problems are delivered within schools. These are called universal prevention efforts when they target all school children or all children within certain grades. Universal prevention programs can be very cost effective if they achieve their intended prevention goals. The National Institutes of Health funded my team to develop and evaluate a universal prevention program that aims to prevent young adolescents from engaging in sexual behavior with younger children. You may be surprised to learn that about half of sexual offenses against young children, prepubescent children, are committed by other children under the age of 18 and usually under the age of 15. One of the main reasons that young adolescents are at risk of engaging in inappropriate or harmful sexual behavior is lack of knowledge. When children enter puberty and they just are beginning to become sexual is when they know the least about sex. They know very little about engaging and consenting sexual behaviors with peers. They do not know the rules, including the rule that younger children are off limits. My colleagues and I designed a program called Responsible Behavior with Younger Children to make this rule explicit. A universal school-based prevention program that targets 12 and 13-year-old children on the cusp of puberty, that seeks to teach these young adolescents and their educators and their parents about the risks of child sexual abuse and to give these adolescents clear messages and strategies to avoid engaging in sexual behavior with younger children. The intervention includes eight sessions intended to increase knowledge about developmental differences between older and younger children, 
to increase empathy for the needs of younger children, and to clearly address the reasons why teens should never engage younger children in sexual behavior. Responsible behavior with younger children also seeks to improve and open up the communication between sexual and non-sexual behaviors between youth and their parents. Ultimately, these changes should reduce sexual behavior by older children with younger children. We're currently testing these outcomes in four Baltimore City public schools. And the last program that I just want to mention briefly is called Help Wanted. This is our most targeted prevention effort. Help Wanted is an online prevention effort that specifically targets adolescents and young adults who self-identify as having a sexual interest in children. This intervention acknowledges that many people with sexual interest in children have no desire to harm children or to abuse children. They need and want and seek help, both for, for managing their attraction to children and for managing the stigma and shame that comes with having such an attraction. With funding primarily from my center and from Reliance, a sexual violence prevention foundation, we've completed the first five sessions of Help Wanted. The topics there address defining child sexual abuse and the harm that it causes, developing a positive self-image, developing a healthy, non-harmful, non-offending sexuality, coping with strong sexual urges, and determining whether, when, and how to disclose one's sexual interest in children to family, friends, or professionals who may help them. If possible, I'm going to try to show just a brief 90-second video that is the welcoming um, video, oh dear, of our, uh, of our intervention. Oh, somebody's helping me. I don't know who that is, but thank you. All right, let's see. So, um, Welcome to Help One, a course to support youth and adolescents who are sexually attracted to children and want to live a safe, healthy, non-offending life. I'm Dr. Ryan Shields from the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Almost daily, we hear from adolescents and young adults looking for help, dealing with the isolation, stigma, and other challenges associated with their unwanted attraction to younger children. We developed this course to let you know that you are not alone. There are others with an attraction to children who are successfully leading happy, healthy, non-offending lives. The course content covers topics such as what child sexual abuse is and the effects and consequences for victims and people who commit abuse. We'll also offer coping strategies you can use to manage your sexual attraction to children. And we'll talk about the importance of building a positive self-image and a healthy sexuality. You can complete the Help Wanted course sessions in any order and you can return to them as often as you like. In them, you'll find video testimonials, interactive exercises, and information to help you manage your attraction to children, navigate the issues you might face because of your attraction, and build your strengths to live a better life. Throughout the course, you'll see this icon, which means there are recommended websites, articles, and other information on the resources page to help you learn more about the topics in the course. We believe in you, and we sincerely hope you'll find this course helpful. Thank you. The three prevention programs that I described, the National Medicaid Policy Evaluation, the Universal School-Based Responsible Behavior with Younger Children, and our targeted online Help Wanted Prevention Intervention. These are all based in the United States. And while these can and will be adapted to other cultures and other languages, they are just a few examples of what is possible. Child sexual abuse affects about 12% of the world's children, more than 246 million boys and girls. Coordinated global efforts are needed to fully address this problem. One such effort is exemplified by the Child Dignity Alliance, with Father, which Father Zollner mentioned. The Child Dignity Alliance speaks to effect, seeks to effectively address and end 
child sexual exploitation and abuse on a global scale. It was established following last year's World Congress on Child Dignity and the Digital Age, hosted by the Center for Child Protection. That World Congress set a milestone in, inter in the international fight against child sexual abuse, exemplified by the Declaration of Rome, signed by His Holiness, Pope Francis. The Child Dignity Alliance has established seven working groups to meet the goals of this declaration. Recognizing the unmet need for valid, effective prevention efforts, the Child Dignity Alliance established the Prevention Research Steering Group in one of its first official acts. The Prevention Research Steering Group is comprised by Father Zollner, myself, and our colleague, Dr. Michael Cito. Following the public health model for violence prevention, which is pictured here, we developed a program of, of research that will use international surveys to establish the scope of sexual interest in and sexual behavior with children by adults. We intend to identify risk factors associated with decisions to harm children, to evaluate promising prevention programs and policies that address child sexual abuse, and finally, to broadly dis disseminate the most effective, scalable, and affordable preventions and policies, prevention programs and policies. While each of these, with each of these broad aims, we specifically include the training of graduate students, early career investigators, and colleagues in low and middle income countries. Like the programs offered at the Center for Child Protection, these educational efforts will help create a cadre of professionals focused on youth safety. Accomplishing these research and educational goals will take significant resources. Finding these resources has been challenging. The kind of research that we propose, the kind of research that is necessary to effectively prevent public health problems like child sexual abuse is too expensive to be fully funded by any single entity. Rather, this will require cooperation, and in particular, it will require government resources. When governments do address child sexual abuse, it is almost always after the fact, which is to say, we put most of our resources into identifying, prosecuting, and punishing offenders. And we put some, usually insufficient resources, into meeting the needs of victims and providing treatment. Holding offenders accountable and meeting the needs of victims are necessary, but insufficient approaches to addressing child sexual abuse. This after-the-fact focus leaves prevention efforts ad hoc and untested. When I bring up the need for prevention resources, policymakers tell me that they agree it would be better to prevent harm from occurring in the first place, that no child should have to experience child sexual abuse, but they just don't have the money. Yet in the US, we routinely invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in a single sex offender. For example, about half of all convicted sex offenders in the United States will spend between 10 and 20 years in prison. It costs $50,000 per prisoner per year, meaning that we are investing $500,000 or more in each one of these individuals. This is a choice. We have made the choice to do this, to put hundreds of millions of dollars into incarceration, sex offender registration, and other after-the-fact interventions. We could also make the choice to fully fund prevention efforts. So far, we've not done so. And our failure to do so harms children. It is essential to convince policymakers that child sexual abuse is preventable, not inevitable. And that funding prevention efforts is essential, not optional. It is my hope and my belief that the church can help with this.
that the church can use its extraordinary powers to convene and to persuade, to convince governments to address child sexual abuse as the preventable public health problem that it is, to invest in prevention as governments already invest in the prevention of other forms of childhood maltreatment, injury, and illness. In this moment in time, as in no other, the church is grappling with its historical role in the perpetuation of child sexual abuse and in the development of a new role for pre preventing and addressing abuse. As the church decides its next steps, I hope it will consider bringing even more of its resources to the prevention of child sexual abuse, and I hope it will strongly advocate for others to do so as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for uh, pointing out what choice we have and we should make. The work of safeguarding needs sustainability and commitment, as we have just heard, and it presupposes formation and education, and that the message of conferences and think tank events is carried beyond the milieu they begin in. That's why we are so grateful that Major Dana Humaid Almar Suki uh, is uh, here with us from the Ministry of the Interior of the UAE. Major Dana was an enthusiastic participant at last year's Congress, and she left with the idea of organizing a follow up event in her home country. And she's now going to explain what this initiative consists of. Good afternoon. I'm always nervous in front of microphones, so excuse me when I ramble the first few minutes. <laughs> so um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here to witness the inauguration of the Safeguarding Masters program. I think for people like me who um, participate in international conversation and dialogues uh, on crimes against vulnerable people, uh, it's rarely that we see progress come out of of those international events, but it wasn't the case with the uh, Child Dignity Alliance. Um, it was an inspirational for us uh, while attending last year to see all the commitment from uh, different participants uh, in the event. And um, that led to us uh, to go back home and uh, reflect. Um, but before doing so and while attending um, the event, I felt very, um, I felt very passionate about continuing the dialogue and the conversation. Um, as a police officer and someone from law enforcement agencies, we have worked with private partners uh, in the private sector and with NGOs and with other uh, government organizations around the world. But I've realized when we were here that we were um, missing out on a, on a, on a great uh, opportunity to uh, work with faith leaders. Um, during past years, when we did a lot of research, we found out that most communities around the world, uh, when asked about who would they rather to go to uh, when they're faced with um, crimes against their children or against themselves in case of being uh, an adolescent or a child, uh, almost always they'd say that they prefer to go to their community leader or their faith leader as opposed to reaching out to the police directly, especially in some communities. So while we were attending last year's Congress, um, I received uh, um, a very um, challenging uh, task from my leadership to come forward by the time we were at the uh, closing statements and commit to hosting a forum, a follow-up forum next year. We thought what's happening here, uh, the efforts of Father Hans and the Steering Committee and the Child Protection Center in the Pontifical Ge Georgian University was too far great for us not to continue and take it forward. So um, as a nation in the United Arab Emirates where I speak first, but as also a representative of my friends and, uh, and partners and the steering committee uh, attempting to host the forum next month uh, in Abu Dhabi in November. Um, 
As a nation, um, we comprise of more than 240 nationalities. We have all faiths in the United Arab Emirates and the spirit of what our country is is coexistence. We've done a lot of work with faith leaders and we've done a lot of interfaith work, but it was always uh, in the niche of um, um, closing the gaps between different uh, ways of approaching religion, uh, coexistence and so forth. So when we attempted this journey uh, and we started working on the agenda, um, I reached out to some of those faith leaders of uh, different faiths by email or by meeting them and um, I was surprised by some of the answers I received. Um, although they were very sympathetic and empathetic as well, um, I received some ideas and thoughts that were not necessarily uh, coming from a bad place, but uh, it was true convention that in the case of, for example, online sexual exploitation, that this was not an actual crime because it's a virtual crime and because there is no physical contact between the victim and the, and the criminal, that it is not a sin. Um, and that opened a different conversation in our steering committee and with my leadership. So we started planning for a trip around the world and workshops. We managed to go to cities like Cairo, Nairobi, Manila, Abu Dhabi, San Domingo, and New Delhi uh, last week. And we met with more than 180 faith leaders from all faiths. Uh, 17 countries participated in those workshops and we took the opportunity in having an open dialogue about what can we do collectively within, our, uh, within their organizations uh, as faith institutions and uh, working with partners like NGOs and government, government agencies and law enforcement, but also working together. And it was such a learning experience for all of us on the committee as well uh, because we started at Cairo and the way we approached it was different. We were humbled throughout the journey to find passion uh, amongst those faith leaders to do more and uh, expand the activities that they were doing already in their communities. And as we were working closely together, we started receiving, uh, within the surveys we've done, some requests to continue doing this, to form what somehow a faith alliance for safe communities to address other crimes as well that uh, uh, vulnerable people are subjected to in our communities. So because we believe that we need to be a part of the paradigm shift that we wish to see in the world, um, we organized the program to happen in two days. And before I talk about the program, um, I would like to thank the Child Dignity Alliance um, the members of the Child Dignity Alliance, uh, We Protect, uh, Ending Violence Against Children, the partnership, um, a lot of uh, individual, enthusiastic uh, individuals. Um, for example, Rabbi Diana, who flew uh, this morning from New York just to be here to support the, uh, the uh, progress and update from everyone, and Baroness Shields and Ernie and uh, Arigato and all of our partners and UNICEF. It was truly a collective effort. Uh, we designed the two-day programs because we were hoping that we would build and mobilize uh, those faith leaders we met around the world. So what will happen in day one of the forum, uh, there will be some addresses from faith leaders uh, and industry and NGOs and academia as well. But also we will host a series of workshops designed and delivered by uh, different partners and by faith leaders themselves we will talk about the challenges that faces them within their institution and also they'll talk about what they can do within their communities to support victims and families and those who have tendencies towards committing um, uh, these crimes. They will also talk and discuss how can they work in partnerships with different organizations around the world. Um, day two uh, will be a call for action. So day one will be more uh, faith leaders from grassroots levels and faith leaders uh, who oversee strategic steer when it comes to operating uh, on the field and in communities. But on day two, it will be a call for action. And we're very happy that a lot of uh, faith leaders from around the world uh, have committed to showing up and coming to Abu Dhabi. 
Um, I can't share all the names because we're still receiving their RSVPs, but for example, uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople is coming, the head of Al-Azhar, uh, which is the, uh, a prominent, moderate uh, Islamic institution, is coming representative of different faiths, the Hindu faith, Buddhist faith, and Sikh faith are also showing up, and those leaders will uh, join in a roundtable discussion uh, in a call for action. Um, I, I thought that I'll end up uh, this journey with an event, but I think what happened is we formed a lot of friendships and partnership and true working relationships uh, that far preceded uh, meeting rooms and workshops. Um, I am left with a renewed uh, faith that the dignity and safety of children online and uh, children dignity in general cannot be done unless we all collaborate and work together. We cannot uh, work on a governmental level with NGOs and with the private sector and oversee the most important uh, element in most of those communities, which is faith leaders and so social leaders. Those people who when we worked with and we met with them and their congregation, we could see the influence, the positive influence they had in their environment and in their communities. So um, I would like to thank the Child Dignity Alliance, Father Hans. Uh, last year was um, a true inspiration for a lot of people. And uh, what made it different is because uh, you practice what you preached. So we really saw action and whatever we came around uh, to discuss actually turned out to be into working groups and a master program and this uh, effort that we've done with partners uh, around the world. I uh, hope that we'll see uh, most of the faces here in Abu Dhabi in November uh, on the 19th and 20th. Uh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share how you inspired us and uh, feel free to approach me and my colleague Hamdan uh, over there uh, if you needed any more information so we could provide it to you. Uh, we also are working on collecting all the surveys we've done with faith leaders because it was a great opportunity. We had almost 180 surveys, so we're working on turning that into a piece of research or academia that we could, uh, could provide us with more insight to the influence of faith leaders when facing a crime such as uh, um, uh, sexual exploitation or uh, crimes that um, attack children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Major Dana, for your enthusiasm, your passion, for coming all the way from uh, Abu Dhabi and for making this forum happen in November. Thank you to all the uh, speakers and for uh, your presence here. We are at the conclusion of the inauguration ceremony. Everyone is now invited to join after a long morning uh, uh, in the reception that is outside this hall in the atrium. But I would also like uh, to remind you of uh, tomorrow, tomorrow evening's event at 8 p.m. again in St. Ignatius Church. And finally, I would ask you, please walk with us, continue together with us on this journey. Uh, we uh, need your questions, your critiques, your support, and your prayers. So let us walk together. Thank you very much. We have now a press conference scheduled here, so the journalists don't go outside, but stay here.
Yes, we would like to begin the press conference now, if we can. Uh, yes, with the, my press colleagues, if you could gather up here in the front, we would like to begin. If my colleagues from the press could gather in the front rows, we would like to begin the press conference now. If we can begin the conference, my colleagues are concerned that by the time we get outside, there won't be anything left for us to eat and drink. So if we can get this part going, it might be a good idea. Thank you. Right, grand. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Sean Patrick Lovett. I'm from the Vatican Media, the Vatican Dicastery. I will just remind you once again here at the table, ready to answer your questions, His Eminence Cardinal Reinhard Marx, Archbishop of Munich, supporter of the Center for Child Protection since its establishment in 2012. On the far end, Professor Elizabeth Letourneau, director of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And the last speaker we heard, Major Dana Humaid, acting director of the Child Protection Center of the General Secretariat of the Minister of the Interior in the United Arab Emirates. Jesuit Father Hans Zollner, president of the Center for Child Protection and academic vice rector of the Ventifical Gregorian University. Colleagues of the various media, you all know the rules, so if you do want to ask a question, please uh, identify yourself and the organization you represent and kindly indicate the person to whom your question is addressed. The floor is open. Carol Glatz, yes. Uh, is there a microphone for, no, can you, yes? Thank you, and good morning from my side. Uh, I've published, or my press officer has published a text. I will not read it, uh, Kellner, but it is published, I think. So you have uh, a, a, a text. Uh, we must act. I, I answer your question, but when everybody is interested in this text of one side, uh, my press officer can distribute it. Or is it is it in the in the? Where is it published? Here in the. Good. Please loud. German and English. Okay. So I think the synod is very uh, a good sit uh, a good opportunity uh, opportunity to speak also about this question. Yesterday I attended. I was not. Uh, already, uh, I have not spoken because I'm uh, then in the, in the next week. This, uh, it's uh, belonging to the different parts of the instrumentum laboris. Uh, but yesterday, I said it in my in my conference here, there were several several uh, interventions also about this subject, and that was very important. <coughs> and we have seen that this subject is uh, present all over the world. And for the youth, it's important because uh, the, the church must show we are a secure, a safe uh, place for children and young people. That's the first. And the other point is 
the young people uh, uh, want a church, a community uh, which is open, authentic, transparent, uh, inclusive, uh, uh, with participation of all, and so on. So also the, the model of church uh, to be together is, is involved in this question. They, they, they have the idea not of a closed shop mentality, so then inclusive. And so the behavior of the church or the responsibles in the church to, uh, towards uh, this question and towards also the, uh, the past is very important also for the, uh, for the image, for the credibility of the church uh, in the community of the young people, I think. And so, so it is very important also for this and also for the vocation, yes. We had the, the, the subject of sexuality yesterday, but we are beginning in the Synod, so I have not to, to make a, a, a summary about the, the Synod. But I think all these subjects, power, I, I mentioned in my, in, my, in my conference, and sexuality are also important when you look on vocation. We don't want the people who are not m mature in sexuality uh, also who, who have an, a, a false uh, idea of chastity, who want to, to have power, and so that is not the way to come in the church to, to be a, a servant of Jesus. So uh, uh, I think the subject, the issues are there, and, and the Synod is very good uh, to, to bring these uh, questions forward. Yes, um, Jacopo Scaramucci, eh? ask a news. questions for Cardinal Marx. The first one, you mentioned uh, the the, that it's necessary also to change the canon law. So can you elaborate on that? For example, at the meeting of the uh, February with all the presidents of the uh, Episcopal Conference, could it be that you decide to introduce, for example, the mandatory reporting for the Catholic Church? And second question, if I may ask you your opinion on the Vigano case, which is, of course, uh, 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 um, the letter of the ex-Nuncio to the United States, where he claims that uh, Theodore McCarrick was... Uh, 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 everybody know, knew about uh, his uh, abuses, and uh, you, you, you said that the public pressure is important and that the public criticism is important. Of course, I... I I'm not going into this letter and the ide ideological uh, level of that, but uh, the Pope didn't respond and the public opinion is wondering uh, whether the Holy See will respond. So what's your opinion on that? Thank you. The discussion about the canon law, I'm not a, a, a canon lawyer, but I, uh, my experience is that we have to develop also. The, the, the last version of the canon law is from 83. And uh, uh, before it was uh, uh, 1917, uh, I think we have not to, 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 to make a new canon law in all, in all aspects, but you have to look what is the development in the church and also uh, how can we deal with these, with these events of the last years of sexual abuse, uh, financial abuse. Uh, are the instruments uh, good? Are, are they, are they, are they to, uh, appropriate? And I think a uh, revision uh, must be seen also in contact with the, with the civil law. It's not, not, not only we as, as the canon lawyers, we, are, we have our own system and so on. No, we have to look, I said it in, in comparison to uh, Lumen Gentium 8, we have to look uh, how societies are, fu are functioning. And 100 years ago, the church was learning from monarchies, I don't know, and, and, and so on. And otherwise, uh, the society learns from church, but they are, they are learning processes. And, and so I, I, I think, uh, the, you see, we have many cases in the doctrine of faith, in the congregation of doctrine of faith. They are not, uh, at the end, we see the lack of persons, we, uh, the level of, uh, of courts, judicial courts all over the world in the canon, in the canon law, uh, in the canon law. Who is working with this? Who are the experts? Are they, are they all experts of these questions? Are they formated in these questions? 
So that was my idea. I, I have no precise uh, uh, projects, but I, I, I have said also in the C9 and I think also in the, in the February meeting that will one question, what, is, what can we do in the, in the, in the zone of, of canon law to change? Have we learned in the last 20 years something about our, uh, our canon law and what, what can we do to, uh, to make also this better? on the level of the, of the normal uh, uh, jury uh, justice, of the normal justice. The second part, I am not informed about, uh, about what, what happened. We discussed, when we were together in the C9, that is, I think, 10 or, or, or two weeks ago, or 10, I don't, I don't, I don't, many, many meetings, but there was a, a great discussion in the presence of the Pope about the, the, the whole situation. We, I, I said we cannot go uh, uh, home without having said that we are, have discussed or we have discussed a little bit about this question. We are not informed about these details. We have not the, uh, the, the, the documents. That is not our task as C9. But we made a small, we have seen perhaps a small uh, uh, um, text, uh, a, a, publication of the pre a public publication of the press, of the press where it said we are in solidarity with the Pope, we are going with him. And we think, I have not the, the text here, but we think that the Holy See will clear up all the questions. These two points. And that is, I think, clear. That uh, I have not uh, the, the actual uh, situation, but uh, normally all the, all the uh, challenges we have in our societies uh, also the Holy See has to, to look on them and to clear, clear up uh, to answer questions. That is clear. As that was our, our position, but we ha cannot, we cannot uh, solve the problem. No? And I don't know how the difficulties are in the, in the different cases. Nicole Winfield. Nicole Winfield from Associated Press. Um, if I make two, two quick questions. One, uh, concerning your, the press statement, uh, you speak about uh, these issues require us to ask questions, sexuality, sexual morals, celibacy, and the training for priests. If, obviously, that is uh, the issue of celibacy always crops up, and there are different views as to whether um, obligatory celibacy is somehow um, fuels this, this abuse crisis. There are uh, studies that say yes, and but I'd like to know your views. Um, and in your remarks this morning, um, you spoke about how inaction on the part of the church uh, would, could well lead to increased state intervention, um, as we've seen in some places in Chile and in the investigations that have gone on. Um, can you elaborate on that? Is that a good thing? Um, when the state actually does force the the issue into a, uh, that that public and that potentially criminal sphere, I cannot judge about others, but I describe the situation when we not act, when we when we don't do our uh, uh, our our job uh, to make transparent and clear. <coughs> And when, the, when there is a suspicion, <coughs> also in Germany, when there is a suspicion that the church or another organization is hiding some uh, crimes, it's clear that the Staatsanwalt, the state, the state attorney, goes in. That is not new. That is a, not a new, a new uh, truth. No, that is always like this. Uh, uh, and if uh, now the, 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 the state can read, ah, oh, there is an organization uh, which uh, has not... Uh, acted in the right way, and perhaps the, there are some some problems, but there must be a suspicion, a real suspicion, not only an idea, and we won't go there and won't look. That is not the problem, I think. And and so I said it in my conference. Look, uh, we cannot go further in a way that perhaps the public has the impression there is an institution uh, which is hiding important things, or, or maybe criminals. We don't know, but but we want to see this. 
We cannot attack the, the state when he, when he does his job. That is the point. If this is necessary, if there are real suspicion, I cannot, I cannot judge about the situation in Chile or in other, other countries, and, and the civil law there is perhaps different to others. <coughs> but in, the normal, in a normal legal state, the state will intervene when he has an, the, 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 the suspicion, the real founded suspicion that there is something criminal which is hiding. That's clear. So my, 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 my point was, be aware of it. Be aware of it and look and work together with the state. And the state is not our enemy, a legal state. I don't speak about the dictators of this world. That is another question where we are speaking about legal states. Democracy is not our enemy. Normally, they, I think they will not destroy the church. They do their job. So let us do our job. The celibacy issue. Yeah, in our in this in this research uh, of the uh, of in, in Germany, <coughs> there were two points in, uh, which are perhaps interesting uh, also the public because they are dealing with sexuality, the celibacy and the homosexuality. But both points it was clear for the professors, and I look on this research. I'm speaking about this text that the celibacy is not the reason for abuse. That is absolutely not the case. But the celibacy in uh, combined with other with other uh, uh, characterize uh, with, with other weakness of the person, no? with other points coming together then, the situation framework and the personality of the uh, uh, of the person. Uh, may be, may be uh, a problem then, or attra can attract persons who are not mature in, in their sexuality and, and so on. That is the point. So the discussion will be there. I, I will not close the discussion about the celibacy, but we have then to look not in the simple way, ah, celibacy is the main problem, we will put out the celibacy and then we will solve this problem. That's too easy, I think. But I think these questions must be there. Are we in the selection of personal? are in the formating of people in the right way, uh, and, and that's the same uh, uh, point with the homosexuality. Homosexuality is not uh, a way to abuse children. That's incredible. What would we say? Incredible discrimination uh, of, of homosexuals. But perhaps, uh, perhaps in a uh, 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 that was the thesis of the, of the professors when the Catholic Church is in an attitude so negative against homosexuals. They hide, the homosexuals hide their sexuality and they go in, and so that is not a good situation to come in, 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 uh, in the priesthood. No? So that, that was the point when I remember the text. Uh, and so also this question must be discussed, but not by the way, but in a, in a, in a in a, in a good uh, dialogue of, uh, of experts and theologians and, 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 and uh, survivors to, 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 to come together. I, I have in my head plans perhaps, but I, I'm not alone. I'm only the president and the other bishops must accept. But I said in our bishops' conference we have to go also in, in, in public discussions or semi-public discussions with experts uh, with, these, uh, with these issues. Sister, yes. But uh, here, here is, of course, nicht immer nur der Kardinal. Not only the Cardinal, we have others here. Yeah. And, uh, I was going to say something about that, actually. Um, I'm Vice Rector in the, here in, the, in Rome at the Dominican University, the Angelicum. Um, first of all, I'd like to make a question to the organizers, so I think it's probably more for the hands. Can you hear me? Oh, no. Is that better? Yeah, that's a bit okay. better. Thank you. Yes. Um, as Father Hans will know better than anyone else here, maybe people who amongst the press know, what some of the key figures in dealing with ch preventing child abuse are religious sisters. They are very heavily involved. The c they are sort of leading people in the Catholic Church for dealing with this issue. I'm just wondering why none of them are up on the platform today. You know, uh, Cardinal Marx talked about this uh, very good word in German, which I didn't write down properly, Verbendung. Verbänderfassung. 
Verblendungszusammenhang. Okay. That was the Just critical like theory of German. Adorno and Horkheimer. But, you know, so. I think there's something here. This kind of gender blindness. You know, yeah. these women should be here. They have a lot to say in a conference like this. Mm. And the other thing I would like to ask the press who are here. So far, all the questions have been to the Cardinals. Yeah. We had two women here who gave excellent talks, and you're not interested to know more about them? You know? I mean, that's a kind of blindness, too. <laughs> you know? So, sorry. Let's just let's, let's put it all out on the table here, all the problems. There was a specific question there, sister, and you did mention Father Hans Zollner, and it was about the representation of women religious on the panel. So uh, let's ask him to respond. Yeah, but I, I am a man and a priest, so I'm not sure whether I should ask, answer that question. Um, we have, as you may have seen during liturgy, we have many religious sisters who uh, are actively involved uh, in the CCP as teachers, as, um, uh, as students, uh, actually from the eight, eight uh, doctor students uh, that we have at the moment, five are religious sisters. All of them come from Africa or uh, Asia. So um, while it is true that on the ground, on the ground, religious sisters do enormous work uh, in the area of schooling, in the area of uh, protecting minors in this world, and I think there is no single force, if you wish, that is so effective in, <coughs> sorry, in the protection of minors than religious sisters um, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, where issues of justice uh, uh, um, with regard to children, receiving justice in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of nurturance and so, and so forth, are not uh, really addressed neither by society nor by other institutions. I have been to more than 50 countries now uh, on all continents with this topic and, and the one group that always is, is consistently present are religious sisters. Um, um, so if we, we need to train uh, people uh, and I'm quite sure that from all the graduates now of our Center for Child Protection's diploma course, I think two-thirds were women and almost all of them were religious women. So uh, over time that will grow into an, a very important um, a resource for the whole church, for the whole um, uh, societies because in those areas where they are they are the experts. There is nobody else there, not from the state and not from NGOs, as consistent, as numerous, and as competent as they are. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm afraid I don't know who you are. If you would identify. It. Yes, my name is Roland Juchem from the German-speaking Catholic news agencies. A question to Professor Letourneau. But closer, okay. Uh, Professor Letourneau, you mentioned, if I remember correctly, that there are currently 12 million victims of sexual child abuse worldwide. Or did I get that wrong? Maybe you could elaborate a bit more on the numbers that are known so far. Um, <coughs> who is, who is um, involved as a victim? In what areas? So that we learn a bit more about that. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, the World Health Organization and researchers that uh, collaborated on that project estimated that 12% of the world's children have been exposed to child sexual abuse, which um, amounts to more than 246 million children. Uh, we know a, a fair amount about the individual level risk factors, both for children to experience sexual abuse and also the individual level risk factors for um, adolescents and for adults to engage in harmful sexual behavior. And of course, they're different for adolescents and for adults. But for example, children with um, any kind of disabilities are at greater risk. Um, girls are at greater risk than boys, but boys are still very much uh, likely to be sexually abused, of course. Um, 
we know that there are some circumstances in which children are more likely to experience abuse uh, if there is insufficient adult supervision, that is a, a key risk factor. Um, and so, and other kinds, experiencing other kinds of abuse is a risk factor for then experiencing sexual abuse. The problem here is that individual level and even family level risk factors and the knowledge of that can only then drive interventions to the individual or interventions to the family. And that's not enough. We need social level and community level interventions and that is where uh, we need to shift our focus to take a broader look at why does child sexual abuse happen more often in some areas and not in others. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, Division of Violence Prevention, runs violence against children surveys, facts surveys, and they provide technical assistance to low and middle income countries to conduct nationally representative sur surveys of children's sexual and physical abuse experiences. And they've com completed about 15 of these violence against children surveys, so in 15 different countries. And what we see are very different rates of child sexual abuse. And in some states, or some countries rather, um, the rates of abuse against boys is higher than the rates of abuse against girls. That's not the norm, but that does happen. We see very different rates between countries in the overall abuse of children. Identify, that's not because of risk factors at the child level or the family level. Those must be driven by community and societal level risk factors. Perhaps things like poverty, perhaps things like poor education, perhaps things like uh, female participation in the workforce and so on. Um, but we do not have a good sense of what drives those differences. And, and that is one area where we very much see, need to see more research. And that research is, as I uh, keep mentioning, very expensive. And it will need to be funded by governments who will need to shift their resources to focusing not only on punishment, not only on addressing the needs of victims, but also on really fully funding prevention science. Yes, absolutely, please, Major Dunn. Um, I just want to elaborate on the professor please. point. Um, um, from a perspective of law enforcement, we, found, we are finding that in the past 10 years, and specifically in seven, uh, there's, a, there's also an increase in the online uh, sexual abuse of children, and um, the ages of those children in those images and uh, videos are... Uh, are getting uh, lower and lower by the year. We've, we're having uh, to deal with some cases where children are six months old. So that also affects the reporting because A, you might not, uh, the child or the family of the child might not know that their image is online and the child is too young to report on what's happening. So the actual final number of ch sexual abuse of children um, is really uh, requires a lot of research, like the professor said, and a lot of resource that goes into exploring the different types of uh, sexual abuse. To add to that as well, um, online exploitation is becoming uh, like a um, commercial activity, but we also cannot um, pinpoint the amount of this illegal economy. So some numbers would say it's $3 billion per year. Some numbers will go up to $20 billion per year. We've met with a lot of experts and we've met with the World Economic Forum, um, uh, some of their committees, and we're trying to find the numbers. But again, we need research because um, sexual exploitation is not happening on the surface net. It's happening in the dark net, which means uh, government-funded research to try to pinpoint uh, the numbers and the figures and the revenues in order for governments and, and, and different groups to um, customize uh, solutions uh, to the size of the problem. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Again, if you would identify. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Benjamin Leven from the German journal Herder Correspondence. I have a question to Father Zollner. Um, we already heard about the, the recent case of American Cardinal McCarrick, and uh, what was brought to our attention was um, that inside the church there's not only a problem um, with uh, sexual abuse of minors, of children, but also with, obviously, sexual harassment of adults and adolescents. So. 
since this is a center for child protection, what would you suggest um, how the church could um, systemic systemically uh, tackle also the problem of sexual harassment of adults, dependent adults like seminarians, for example, or um, women, religious? Yeah, here again, um, the picture is very mixed. You have areas in the world where this is uh, already addressed. You have countries like Australia, US, um, at the moment, we don't talk about 30, 70 years ago, we talk about today, uh, where you have codes of conduct, you have professional standards. I have been in Australia four weeks ago and they have a very thorough uh, training and they have very clear responsibilities for um, professional standards. They are enforced uh, on, on various levels. This is as far as you can get today, and I'm pretty sure that um, for the time being, today, um, in, in some of those countries, this issue is uh, certainly addressed. In other countries, it's not. Why? Uh, because the whole um, sensitivity and awareness uh, about this is growing. Now, you have a case in India <coughs> recently, two or three days ago, we learned that a bishop has been arrested for the alleged rape of a religious sister. Now, we will see whether this is proven or not, substantiated or not, but anyway, he has been uh, arrested. But what was uh, even more surprising somehow is that there were religious sisters in Kerala of all areas in India and of all countries in India um, um, that were protesting and marching in support of the, the religious sister. You could not have imagined that two years ago in a society uh, <clears throat> that is very conservative in terms of relationship between the sexes, like I mean, I've lived for some years, in, uh, some time in, in, in India, and uh, 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 that was 15, 16 years ago, and you could not sit on the same side in a bus with a woman with whom you are not married. So in a society like that, things are changing, and uh, it is uh, certainly <coughs> something that will, will be more prominently uh, and, and, and more on the spot uh, it will need the proper attention, sure. And the thing is that we, 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 we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are good models there, which have to be adopted uh, and adapted to the, um, to the culture. Um, so there is no one fits all approach because people, even in this country, uh, greet each other differently in Milan and in Palermo. Yeah? So uh, talk about 200 more countries in the world and uh, millions of uh, cultures and subcultures. So there is uh, the necessity to really spell out what is appropriate behavior, but some things are clear across all cultures. And this is uh, connected not so much only or foremost in, in the area of sexuality, because as the Cardinal said before, and as Pope Francis has written in his letter to the people of God, this is a combination of abuse of power, abuse, abuse of conscience, and, and abuse of sexuality. So it is the broader picture, and this is why a center for child protection has a certain remit and scope. But certainly, over time, I see that this is, this is not enough. We, we will need to reflect on what this means, that other areas and other concerns come into the picture um, that concern the safeguarding at large, if you wish. But this is also a learning process. We are on a steep learning curve. I will perhaps underline this. Okay. Also personally, I am now 65. When I think about my, my uh, time as a 10-year-old boy, mm -hmm. what was, uh, how was the talking about homosexuality? Doesn't exist, didn't exist. And, and other questions, so that is, a, a learning process and we see also in other cultures they are learning. We don't know wh when and how, that is not our, our decision that is in these countries you will have the 
a situation, but I, I hear in the, in the Synod Aula, the, the people, the bishops from Asia, and they, they see what happened in Germany now. now. The blocks and, and the informations are there more than <coughs> 20 years ago, 30 years ago, so they can see also the women. They come together and say, what is this here? We don't accept this uh, any longer, and so on. So, so, so the, 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 the possibility that groups come together, uh, mail to each other, inform each other, that's a, a new situation. And when we said uh, 10 or 20 years ago, or in India, Africa, well, other people, they have more tolerance in these things. And, and all these stupid things. Also with the discussion, I remember human rights. Yeah, human rights, it's, you must see that in other countries, it's not so, what is this? Stupid, stupid. Uh, you have, and also in the, in the uh, discussion about sexual re revolution, I heard it also in the, in the last years. Ah, oh, that was in the 70s. Uh, uh, the sexual revolution is guilty for, for all these things and so on. I will not discuss about this and, and defend the sexual revolution. That is another, that's may, may, maybe not my, my, ch my challenge or my task. But in every culture, I will underline this, you know uh, what is power and violence. And when you, uh, when also the children, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when there were, were violence in the, in the schools, everywhere, from the teachers. But the people, the, the young people, they remarked exactly when the front, the border, the frontier was, uh, was surpassed from the teacher. What was acceptable in this culture and, was, and what was absolutely uh, humiliating the other person. Sadism and so on. They knew it. I, I talked to the old people at that time. They were very clear about what is allowed and what is not allowed. And I think that is in all cultures. In all cultures, you can see uh, this, uh, uh, this point. Thank you, Cardinal Marx. There is a press release available in hard copy. Otherwise, you can download it from the website of the CCP. Um, Big thank you to my colleagues, especially the Vaticanisti, who are working on their bi-location, trying to be here and at the Vatican Press Office at the same time. In the press release, you can find the names and the titles of our panelists, whom I thank on behalf of the Center for Child Protection. Um, if you're following your news feed, you will have seen that the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded this morning and it was awarded to Iraqi Nadia Murad and Congolese Denim Kwege for their work on ending sexual abuse and sexual violence as a weapon of war. So, thank you. Thank you to our panelists, Father Zolder, and thank you for being here. See you later. <laughs>